This is Northern Light for Thursday, October 31st. Happy Halloween. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Catherine Wheeler. Election Day is less than a week away, and North Country voters will be bo- voting for more than president. We take a look at very local races like town justice, county judge, and town boards, and the impact they have on residents' daily lives. Anybody that doesn't think local elections have any weight, that all oh, the local politics don't matter, they're fooling themselves. In doing so, they, they the phrase, I think, is cut off your nose to spite your face. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is running for another term. She kicked off the last week of campaigning with a speech to thousands of Trump supporters. Hello, New York! And her Democratic opponent, Paula Collins, debated herself in Glens Falls. Are we going to further democracy or are we going to pull back on democracy? and a conversation with finger-picking guitarist Andy Cohen about the heart of traditional fiddle music ahead of his concert in Elizabethtown this weekend. All that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Support for Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio comes from Gray & Gray & Associates CPAs, an accounting and financial services firm in northern New York with offices in Canton, Potsdam, and Spring Hill, Florida. GrayCPAS.com. And by Cronin's Golf Resort, offering golfers the opportunity to experience the fall foliage. Details at Cronin'sGolfResort.com. Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Catherine Wheeler. The presidential election is on everyone's minds right now, but on Tuesday, people will also elect dozens of local officials, mayors, supervisors, council people, judges, justices. Those small races will have big impacts on their communities. We recently asked people in NCPR's texting club what down-ballot races they're paying attention to and how much they believe local offices influence their lives. Amy Fireisel reports back on what you told us. Dave Romai was born and raised in Messina. His father, Charlie, was a St. Lawrence County legislator in the 90s and early 2000s. He says he really admired the work his father did, and it pains him to see so many uncontested races this year. The easy answer, I think, is apathy. Just, eh, I don't want to get, I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to get involved. I, I'm sure that, that the fact of the matter is that we are in an economically disadvantaged area, Romai says many people don't have the time or the energy to get involved in local politics. He also says he hears a lot of people talk about how they're essentially powerless, but he doesn't believe that. Anybody that doesn't think local elections have any weight, that, oh, the local politics don't matter, they're they're fooling themselves. In in doing so, they, they the phrase, I think, is cut off your nose to spite your face. Romai is obviously passionate about local democracy, and so were most of the other folks who responded to NCPR's question about down-ballot races and locally elected officials. But not many people did. Usually when we ask questions through our texting club, we might see between 50 and 150 responses. This time, it was just two dozen. And a lot of them mentioned apathy and disengagement. What's frustrating? um, Lack of involvement. That's Lynn Hall of Potsdam. And I'm not free of any guilt on that one. I, I never went to town or village board meetings. That is, until she was elected onto Potsdam's town board in 2021. Hall says it's easy to think of politics as something that's happening instead of something you're involved in. As a professor at SUNY Potsdam, she says she sees this in her own union. You know, people say, I wonder what the union will do about it. And I want to say, well, we are the union. <laughs> you are the union. Paul says the issues that town and local officials deal with aren't always exciting. Taxes, potholes, the water treatment plant. But they're really important for people to have a good life, to be able to live in their town without problems. You know, we need people to advocate for our towns and our villages at the state level, particularly, and at the federal level. Civic involvement, like volunteerism, is on the decline. When Hall was elected, less than a third of Potsdam's registered voters cast a ballot. 
So that's a very small number of people who are showing their investment in who's making the decisions in their municipalities. Elected officials like Call also have a real hand in money matters. They vote on budgets, they write grants. And some of this involves a lot of taxpayer money, like the COVID relief funds that town and county governments received in 2021 and 2022. It was rather unexpected. It was a lot of money. Joe Lawrence lives in Lauville, and he volunteers on the board of the Lewis County Industrial Development Agency. If there wasn't a good plan in place for how to use it, you could end up looking back in a few years wishing you had spent it differently. It was millions and millions of dollars. That money has been used for road repairs, sewer fixes, child care. And Lawrence says it's local legislators who made those decisions. Here in Lewis County, I think there was a really good team effort among a lot of local officials and the recognition that if this money was used for more strategic investments in the community, that it, it would have ripple effects and, and multiplier effects. When it comes to local officials, there are sort of two buckets. Folks dealing with how to run things, think legislators and supervisors, and people dealing with the law, sheriffs and judges. Aaron McGill in Plattsburgh wrote, The town justice position is a particularly important one to watch. It boggles my mind that New York State town justices do not need any law background at all and only are required to have a 12-day training to do the job. In this year's election, most town justice positions are going uncontested, just one candidate. The one contested race in Essex County is for the county judge position. It's a big 10-year term. County judges deal with intimate, tough issues in family, probate, and criminal law. When I was living in New York City, I, you know, personally experienced the, the power that the judge had over my life for decades, really. Annabelle Fave has been living in the U.S. since the late 1990s and was in family court over the custody of her son as an immigrant mother. Fave became a U.S. citizen in 2011. Now she's going to vote for the Essex County judge. This is something I want to make sure I, you know, participate in. This is our one chance to have our voices heard and to make sure we elect people that we think are competent, trustworthy, and dedicated to each uh, case uh, equally. But what about when it's hard to know who to put in power? That's something Brian Farinell from Queensbury has been thinking about a lot lately. He says it feels like it's getting harder and harder to find information about local races. A lot of local media have either disappeared or shrunk in their, in their coverage. A lot of times you have to uh, rely on social media. As recently as 10 to 15 years ago, Farinell says he could find comprehensive coverage of down-ballot races in local papers, multiple stories, even investigative reporting. It it felt like you had enough information to at least have a general idea of what to do, how to cast an informed vote. Now you're getting one story in an an election cycle. You might not get anything other than, you know, a, a capsule of a candidate answering a canned question. Farinell says that often doesn't feel like enough to decide who should wield a lot of power. With so many uncontested races in 2024, there are fewer decisions to make overall. But the votes people cast in their local races will have long-lasting impacts on the communities they live in. Amy Feierisel, North Country Public Radio. For more information on early voting, how to find out if you're registered, where your polling place is, and who the candidates are, visit ncpr.org and click on the North Country Voter Guide right on the top of the homepage. The two candidates for New York's 21st Congressional District kicked off the final week before Election Day in very different venues. Kara Chapman has more. On Sunday night, Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik took to the stage at Madison Square Garden. Hello, New York! She was one of many who spoke to the sold-out crowd of thousands of Donald Trump supporters. She criticized the Biden-Harris administration for its handling of the border, inflation, and conflicts like the war between Israel and Hamas. Stefanik said this election is the most important in our lifetime. No matter where you go, whether it's in New York City, upstate New York, or in any of the swing states, people understand there is so much at stake. And it is we the people When we vote for President Donald J. Trump, we the people will save America. At a much smaller event the following night, Stefanik's Democratic opponent Paula Collins agreed the stakes of this election are high, but for different reasons. 
Are we going to further democracy or are we going to pull back on democracy? According to the Glens Falls Post Star, which posted the audio, about 50 people went to the Crandall Public Library to watch Collins debate herself. Collins said she and her team invited Stefanik to attend the debate multiple times. The Congresswoman's campaign said she wouldn't be participating. At the event on Monday night, Collins criticized Stefanik, saying she continues to not accept the results of the 2020 election and has given vague answers about whether she'd accept the results of this election. In an interview with CNN earlier this year, Stefanik suggested that she wouldn't have certified the results of the 2020 election had she been vice president at the time. Collins called on Stefanik to resign. She has shirked her uh, oath of office to protect and defend the United States Constitution. We have every indication from her that she plans to do the same in the days and weeks ahead. Asked for a response, Stefanik senior advisor Alex DeGrasse said the congresswoman is, quote, running on her record of results and is absolutely positioned to once again earn the most total votes of any candidate in North Country history. Stefanik heads into Election Day with huge advantages. Those include millions in campaign cash, name recognition, and a strong alliance with Trump, who is popular in the North Country. Collins has said, regardless of the outcome, she plans to run again in 2026. Kara Chapman, North Country Public Radio. This is NCPR. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 812. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Catherine Wheeler. Stick around for a look back at a conversation with a folk artist ahead of his concert in Elizabethtown this weekend. That's in just a few minutes here on Northern Light, which is supported by Cedar Hedge Farm Lowville, producers of farmstead goat cheeses, baked goods, and more. Cedarhedgefarm.com. And by the Bookstore Plus Lake Placid, supplier of books, stationery, art supplies, and more, with online shopping available. More at thebookstoreplus.com. Music now from Tim Ellifritz out of Johnsburg. NCPR is a media sponsor for Queer Tales, presented by Potsdam Pride, coming up next Thursday, November 7th at 5 o'clock at Jernabe Coffee House in Potsdam. Tell your true five-minute story or just come to listen. For more details, visit ncpr.org slash calendar. state is accepting public comment on the largest proposed solar project in the Adirondack Park. According to the Adirondack Explorer, the project is called Foothill Solar. If approved, it would bring a 40 megawatt facility to 200 acres of a dairy farm near Great Scandaga Lake in Fulton County. The State Office of Renewable Energy Siting and Electrical Transmission, or ORES, says Foothill Solar would produce enough energy to power almost 11,000 households. The Explorer reports it's the first solar facility in the Adirondack Park to go through the ORES res permitting process. The deadline for public comments to be submitted to ORES is at 5 p.m. Friday, November 1st. That's tomorrow. The State Department of Environmental Conservation is offering $4.5 million to private landowners to establish new forests. The funding comes from the Establishing Large Forest Grant Program, whose goals include mitigating climate change, providing wildlife habitat, and protecting air and water quality. Private landowners with five or more acres of unforested land in New York can apply for grants of up to $750,000. The money will reimburse eligible projects like site preparation, tree planting, or removal of competing vegetation. Applicants must agree to maintain the new forest for at least 15 years. A webinar on the program will take place in a couple of weeks on Thursday, November 14th. Applications will be accepted until early January. 
And a major Warren County manufacturer no longer plans to leave the North Country. Angiodynamics is a healthcare device manufacturer that employs more than 300 people. Earlier this year, it announced plans to shut down its Queensbury and Glens Falls facility by the end of 2025. The Glens Falls Post Star reports the company now says it'll consolidate operations into just the Queensbury location. That'll shrink the current local workforce to about 140 employees. The operation will support Angiodynamics med tech portfolio. Those devices are used in cardiovascular oncology. Military doctors are largely prohibited from performing abortions. In the five years before the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, they performed a total of fewer than 100. That leaves service members almost entirely reliant on private clinics in states where abortion remains legal. Steve Walsh of the American Homefront Project visited one of them. At a Women's Choice Clinic in Danville, Virginia, they leave a journal on the table for clients to offer their thoughts to the people who come after them. I can tell you this much. You will get through this. You have made the best choice for you in your circumstances, and you have a whole lot of life uh, left to experience and enjoy. Clinic manager Daniel Floyd says it's another way to build community. Let them know they're not alone, and that's a really big thing for us here is you are not alone. The Danville Clinic opened in February as a reaction to shifting state laws. It's in rural Virginia, just minutes from the border of North Carolina, which restricted access to abortion last year. Jacksonville, Florida had been their busiest clinic, just minutes from the Naval Air Station. When Florida's six-week ban went into effect in May, women headed north, says Amber Gavin, spokesperson for the clinics. In Danville, about 50 to 75 percent of our patients are traveling from out of state. Some are from Georgia, um, many are from Florida. Basically, all the states that are beneath Virginia, our folks are traveling here. Women in the military are largely left to navigate this changing system on their own. The Hyde Amendment has been inserted into federal defense bills since the 1970s. It restricts abortion on military bases to cases of rape, incest, or where the life of the mother is at stake. Military doctors perform few abortions. The language impacts both patients and their military doctors, says Dr. Tony Marengo, a former Navy lieutenant commander. There was some lapse, I believe, in their family planning training because they had mentors who were told, oh, we can't even talk about abortion. And so you're not able to counsel your patients on the full scope of medical care because of misunderstanding and stigma. Marengo was the first family planning OBGYN in the military as a civilian at the Naval Hospital in San Diego. She left the Naval Hospital in 2018 to become the chief medical officer for Planned Parenthood in San Diego. And I felt very stifled. It, even as a civilian working in a military organization, I could not speak freely. I could not write op-eds. I could not advocate as much as I wanted to for the patients I was taking care of. With military doctors performing so few abortions, the task falls on providers in states like Virginia, which haven't imposed more restrictive laws. Clinics are straining under the influx of new patients. Amy Pasqua, director of the Hampton Roads Reproductive Justice League in Virginia, says they initially saw a large jump in donations in 2022 after Dobbs. We are struggling to keep up because the demand has not decreased after, you know, all the fanfare of it. Donations have definitely dropped off. So as a fund, we're definitely struggling. The group helps women pay for the procedure, travel, and helps connect women with providers, including those coming from around the country, including military clients. Now we have all these military personnel coming over to seek health care. No, this isn't sustainable. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Sharon Arana leads Sword Athena, an Air Force group that looks at barriers women face in the military, including access to abortion. Their work led to some of the changes put in place by the Pentagon after Dobbs, including the policy that allows women to take leave to find care on their own. Right now they're saying the best we can do is get you to an outside clinic, right? And they have basically like washed their hands of us, of women like me, saying that, yeah, well, go find it yourself, and here's a train ticket. She wants Congress to end the Hyde Amendment, but efforts to remove it from the most recent annual defense bill were unsuccessful. In Norfolk, Virginia, I'm Steve Walsh. This story was produced by the American Homefront Project, a public media collaboration that reports on American military life and veterans. This is NCPR.
listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. Good morning, I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Catherine Wheeler. Stick around after the show for Bird Note. That's coming up at 842 with our eyes to the skies, sunset and speculator. Uh, I mean, speculator is <laughs> <laughs> sunset is at 540 at 549 tonight. And pack a flashlight for trick or treating. The moon is a waning crescent at just 1% a full. In the weather forecast today, we can expect sunny skies and warm temperatures for trick-or-treating this afternoon. Highs in the 70s expected for much of the region. Rain showers starting, but not until 8 or 9 or so this evening. That will be cooling things off for the day tomorrow with highs tomorrow in the mid-50s to lower 60s and even cooler Uh, during the day on Saturday with highs in the 40s or lower 50s for much of the region. At last check, it was 20 degrees in Cornwall, Ontario, 65 degrees right now in Aquasasne, 49 in Queensbury, 58 degrees in Saranac Lake, 53 degrees in Boonville in the Tug Hill Plateau and in the Champlain Valley, 64 degrees in Peru right now. We want to introduce you to the Roots and Blues musician, Andy Cohen. He's a native of Quaker Springs in Saratoga County and now calls Memphis his home. And he's coming back to the North Country this weekend to do a couple of shows alongside Adirondack folk legend Bill Ellis at Piano by Nature in Elizabethtown. Cohen sees blues and folk music in a whole community of musicians, and it's a passion that he's shared with other North Country folkies, including Ellis and the late Joan Crane. Today, we'll listen back to a conversation I had with him in 2021 when he dedicated a local show to Crane. Cohen talks about this music almost like it's his calling to carry on these traditional pieces from Southern roots and folk musicians in the early 1900s like Mississippi John, Sonny Terry, Donnie McGee, Honey Boy Edwards, and Reverend Gary Davis. A lot of people think they can write a traditional fiddle tune. And I don't think you can do that Folk music, as you see it, technically it should be the, the professional practice of amateur music, right? That farmers and sharecroppers and peasants of all kinds and can play the dickens out of their instruments. That's what I study. What draws you to this roots in blues music, these traditional pieces? I like the old music just because it's old. It's still strong. It kicks butt. My job is to keep these songs in the air, not just on record or on in a museum or on a piece of manuscript paper, but to actually do them. And I want to do the Dickens out of them. If I had my way, if I had my way, if I had I spend a certain amount of time studying arcane instruments. They tell me stories. They tell me about the immigrants who played them. They tell me about the kind of music that people liked a hundred some years ago. And in that vein, you're going to be playing an instrument called the dulciola. Dulciola. (laughs) Let me tell you what a dulciola is. Yes, please. The instrument was made between 1903 and 1907 by a couple of guys in Toledo, Ohio, with little bitty changes as to go along. So I keep a database of them. I have serial numbers up over 5,000, and every time I get a new number, I add it to my database. Um, So I got about 40 instruments. 40 dulciolas. If I know the number, I can tell you how the instrument was made. And if I can see the instrument, I can tell you what year it was made without looking at the number. Yeah. There are some nuts like us. I was 
going to ask, though, what your connection is to the North Country finger-picking guitarist Joan Crane. She was my first student. She was your first student? Yes. The show next weekend, it's in honor of Joan Crane, right? We've been trying to have a dedicated Joni Fest since she passed away about three years ago. So this is my opportunity. She took the music that I showed her. I showed her something by Big Bill Brunsey. The next thing I know, she made a record and she put that on it. It was called Shuffle Rag. Joan ran up and down the North Way for 40 or 50 years, playing every coffee house from Cafe Lino up to Plattsburgh, and she played in the Grange Hall, Deerhead Inn. She lived behind the post office in Moscow. There's a clutch of folkies that live on both sides of Lake Champlain. Her professor, Dr. Bill Ellis, lives up in North Parisburg. Kieran Means lives up your way. Steve Feinblum was Joni's bass player. So in a lot of ways, Joni is seminal and unites the folk music scene from Scroon Lake on up to Plattsburgh. Knew the history of her area, she was of service to it. So we all felt, we all were close to Joni in, in our own way. I think Joni was exactly as old as me. She would have been 75. With everyone that we lose, the culture is a little bit that much thinner. So we celebrate them in hopes of recruiting another one. Would you like to learn to play the guitar and play this kind of music? I have thought about at least learning to play the fiddle. We do have really top-notch fiddlers throughout the North yeah, Country. You sure do. You sure do. Pete Sutherland is one of the best in the country. Do you mind um, playing a piece right now? Let me, let me play something for Joni. If you knew Joni, you'd know that she was about five foot nothing, right? I taught her this piece called Long Tall Mama. <laughs> That was Andy Cohen. He's performing Saturday evening and Sunday afternoon at Piano by Nature in Elizabethtown alongside Bill Ellis and Eleanor Ellis. Find more details at pianobynature.org. This story first aired in 2021. Well, she do a little this pretty mama. Well, she do a little that. She do a little this pretty mama. Well, she do a little that. When she gets to roll, a big freight train jump the track. That's it for the show for the day. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Catherine Wheeler. Have a happy Halloween. To a room, Lordy, how she struck us, dog. When she walks into a room, Lordy, how she struck us, dog. Dig 